Thank you, Karen, as always, for kicking us off. Um, my name is Lee Blackwell, and I'm a solutions architect here at Databricks. And probably like many of you tuning in, I have um, myself been a personal victim of trying to monitor Spark streaming queries. So I'm really excited to learn from our, our guests today um, what they've got in store. Um, how about you, John? I'm pretty much in the same boat, Lee. Uh, have, <laughs> have had issues uh, monitoring as well. And especially with a couple customers, there's definitely uh, best practices around it and really looking forward to learning a couple new ones as well. Yeah, uh, you know, it's coming from data warehousing and BI. One of the new trends that I'm seeing in the marketplace is streaming CDC changes from, from databases into the, the lake house, as it were. And I'm seeing a lot more customers ask, well, how do I monitor these streams? What's going on? How do I know it's running? Uh, and this is, I think, a great time to talk about what, uh, what, what Hector and Dustin are going to be presenting with us today. With that, would you like to introduce yourself, Hector? Yeah, yeah. So I'm Hector Camarena, Solutions Architect for Databricks. I've been at Databricks for almost two years now. Um, at Databricks, I manage 15 plus accounts uh, here in the Minnesota area. Um, and I also, you know, work closely with our uh, SS, SME group for streaming, uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, today you get to see one of the projects I've been working on internally. And actually, uh, up until now, uh, this work, the solution has been all internal for our engineers. Um, but now it's like the first time going public a little bit to, to share across, across customers and people using Spark, right? So it's, it's going to be nice to share with everyone today. Uh, Dustin, I hand it over. Yeah, hey, I'm Dustin Vanoy. I'm a data engineering consultant out of San Diego. And so been doing a lot of Spark, a lot of Databricks on Azure primarily, uh, sharing about it on my blog and YouTube. So I was glad to be able to take some of that and, and bring it here live in the Collab Lab with everybody. Uh, obviously, I've been doing some, some monitoring and Spark streaming myself, and I wish I would have met Hector or at least seen Hector's solution years ago because I had to kind of build a, a hack together version myself. And so share a little bit more about that as we go. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So let's uh, let's get into it. You have something you guys want to share? Yeah, I'll kick us off and I'll share my screen in just a minute with the demo. But first, let's kind of set the stage. So um, when we're talking about Spark structured streaming jobs, it's it's really not that hard to develop them. It's not that different initially from batch jobs, I would say. So developing anything's hard. Don't get me wrong. But once you got a batch job, converting it to streaming isn't too bad from the code perspective. But once you want to deploy that and monitor it, those questions that, that Franco already asked is, is it working? <laughs> that, the, the way you answer that's a little bit different because you now need to know, is it continuing to work? I can't just like check it once a day and make sure it fired off, right? And so um, we're going to talk through some of the tools that Databricks has by default that are very handy. These tools are really available and most of them are open source Apache Spark. You'll see them in pretty much any managed service. We'll go through the default tools, but we'll also talk about how you might need to take it to the next level. So the stuff Hector is going to show us um, af after I introduce the default UI, is, it's the type of thing I've had to do. And I think Hector's done a great job of it. He's got a solution accelerator that I'm excited for everyone to see. And like I said, I wish I would have seen it a few years back. Um, so let's, let's put ourselves in context first, and then we'll do the demo. So let's pretend that we're a data engineering team and we have some kind of video streaming platform. So maybe we're taking on Netflix, maybe we're you know, one of the many different uh, stations that has their own streaming platform now. So we have video videos that customers are viewing and we need to take streaming events of those videos. So, you know, every segment of a video produces an event to Kafka. We want to consume that with Spark, put it in Delta Lake and probably do quite a bit of other like processing and recommendations and maybe some user dashboards to show them, you know, how long they've spent on each type of video, that kind of thing. So when we're in that, in that, position, as soon as we're ready to go to production, the questions are going to come up of, is it working? Um, how much lag between when the person watches an event online and when it shows up in this first stage, the first Delta Lake table, um, eventually you'll need to answer the end-to-end -end questions of, you know, how long till it's in this final table that the CEO looks at, that kind of thing. We want to support batch analytics and streaming jobs. So we need to answer even, you know, a wide variety of those questions. And we also probably want to set up some sort of alerts on if, things look slower than they should be. Even if it's the producer's fault, even if Kafka stops getting data, we want to know as the data engineering team that something's wrong because they're going to look at us and go, you're the one that's supposed to give us the data. Where is it? So with that, I'll share my screen and we'll 
walk through a, a structured streaming job and how we monitor that with the default tools. Okay, so someone shout if you don't see Azure Databricks right now. I'm working with the default uh, cluster. The only thing I've set up here is uh, streaming metrics enabled, which will turn on a couple of things uh, for us. I'll try and call out as we go. And we're on um, Databricks runtime 8.3, Spark 3.1.1. I think most of what I'm showing was available 7.1 forward. So what we're going to start with is the SQL tab of, of the Spark UI. And this is where you'd start with batch or streaming. There's nothing there because nothing's running. So that's, that's the first clue. You got to run something before you're going to see things in the UI. This is just going to produce a bunch of video events for us. Nothing too, too important for our conversation today besides we need data. And then here is the final piece of my structured streaming job where I name the query. So this is tip number one for you if you're new to this is if you name your query, you're going to be able to see it in the UI and, and figure out which query you're looking at. Uh, my trigger time is five seconds, which doesn't change a whole lot for what we're doing today, but it comes up from time to time when we're talking about latency and things like that. Okay, so what's hopefully going to happen is I click this button again to refresh, and I've got, you can see quite a few queries have run. Actually, most of them are just the notebook queries so far. Let's refresh again and see what we got. There we go. So we have some queries running. I think this might be the one I want to show you first. When I click in on the details, I can see that one, one query that ran for, for the micro batch is this piece that's actually pulling from Kafka. And I already pulled it up for you, so it's a little bit bigger. So what it shows me if I kind of go over each piece, I'll go very quickly for you, is I am reading from Kafka. I have a Kafka scan. It's giving me a Kafka record back. You'll, you'll get used to that over time if you're new to Kafka, Kafka consuming. Uh, it's going to do some amount of projection here in this whole stage code gen. I actually would kind of have to look at my code and figure out what this part is. Then I can see that, oh, I'm taking from JSON, I'm doing some conversion, I'm doing some renaming, doing some cast, and then finally basically projecting it out for the rights to Delta Lake. So this is the same for batch or streaming. You'll get more used to what this means over time if you really need to get in the weeds to, to see how it's going. But once your streaming job starts, it's usually gonna stay pretty consistent there. The thing that's really cool and really specific to streaming is the structured streaming tab. Now this came out in Spark 3, and so it's been around for a little bit now. And you can, uh, you can see some high level information like the input rate and process rate. That's really handy, especially if you have a lot of streams you can kind of just scroll through real quick, see what's going on. Usually what, to, what I'm going to do is jump into the details of this. And we're gonna get something that is very useful. Uh, Hector's gonna take it to the next level, like I said, but this is, this is useful. So we have an input rate and a process rate kind of one on top of the other, and we can look for, is my processing rate staying consistently higher than my input rate? So as long as that's happening, I know that I'm able to keep up with uh, the data coming in. Once my input rate starts to get high and my processing rate lower, uh, I might have an issue on probably introducing more latency than I need to, and I can add more parallelization to the cluster, uh, maybe um, scale out the cluster, those kind of things. In addition, we have input rows. If you know a bit about your data and how much data is supposed to be coming in, this is very uh, helpful to look at. Uh, in addition, the batch duration is going to help us get, a, get an idea of latency. And so if you hover over, you'll see it's about three and a half seconds. The histogram gives me kind of a range here. So maybe up to a six second uh, duration for each micro batch. So uh, I'm going to assume that every time it goes to that trigger runs, it's going to go and within about five or six seconds from running, it'll have written data to Delta Lake. So that's what I'll tell people. Yeah, give it six to six to 10 seconds to be safe. And you should have your data in Delta Lake. And for analytics, a lot of times that's plenty fast and we're good. I can stay with my cheap, cheap, small cluster here and not go, go tuning it anymore uh, for larger loads or for uh, more, <clears throat> more real time feedback to the customer. We might need to amp that up a bit. And then the last chart. I don't do a lot with this, but this is the operation duration. If I'm having batch duration that seems too long, I can kind of see what's, what's taking up the most time. And add batch is normally taking up the most time, but if something else is taking up a bit of time, that's, that's meaningful. So Dustin, I can, yeah. can read this is basically kind of the, the first couple seconds or milliseconds was, a, was catching up or kind of starting the stream where there's drop-offs in the graphs. Is that how I can read this? Yeah, the, the, the first batch is usually going to grab a bunch, uh, for me at least, it's going to grab data that's been on Kafka that's waiting to get pulled. And so it's going to get all of that in the first batch. Sometimes I see it happen in the second batch too. Um, and so in the first or second batch, we'll see it grab a bunch of data and then it kind of levels off. So this is pretty consistent because my data generation is fairly consistent, right? In a real world, I usually see some spikes here and there. And what I'm looking for is 
process rate is, is spiking higher, better than input rate. Um, and Hector can share more about what he sees a lot, but I, I definitely see spikes and, and a little less consistency. Um, but usually the first batch is, is quite a bit higher. And eventually that you'll see this, this chart's a fairly small window of time. So eventually that kind of trails off and we have a little bit more of a, a consistent graph the whole way through. Yeah. Okay. One other thing, if you're having trouble, I'll just call this out super quick, is this executors tab. It's not where I spend a lot of my day, but uh, if I'm worried, I go and check, do I have any dead executors? Do I have failed tasks? Uh, maybe look at the garbage collection time. If I'm not getting errors, I still might wanna see that garbage collection time isn't too high. And if you really get into it, uh, I might be able to share some stateful streaming stories in a, in a future thing, not today. Uh, the heap histogram can help you see what's taking up all that memory once you start hitting out of memory errors. Uh, thread dump, if you're gonna go really deep, that's helpful as well. Um, let's focus though on something else that, yeah. Justin, uh, before you move on, could you uh, just explain what uh, a dead executor is? Yeah, so- um, Thank you. Exec go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, our driver is gonna be kind of controlling the application, executors are going to be running the application. So in this case, I've got two executors, two worker nodes is, is how, the, how my cluster is set up. And so if one of those worker nodes dies, then that's going to show up as dead and a new one will spin up in its place. If you're using yarn or something like that, you might see a bit more action in this executors tab. On Databricks, I don't see them very often. I'm not sure about you all, but thankfully I don't see these very often in Databricks. Yeah, thankfully not. Thank you. <laughs> all right. While I know we've got some data flowing, let me show you. I won't spend too much time on logs, but logs are super important. And if I'm being real, I spend a lot of time looking at the output of my logs. And usually what I do is I have these automated to go to Azure Log Analytics. Uh, there's a library you can install and do things like that on, on Azure Databricks. Uh, otherwise it'd be like Elasticsearch or something. And usually standard errors when I have bad data or I've written some bad code, I'll see some error messages there. But Log4j output is gonna have a whole lot of information. And somewhere in here, Somewhere in here is the information that we're gonna talk about a bit with Hector. And it's not showing up, of course. Um, I'll mm -hmm. show you it another way, don't worry. Well, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll pause right there and just say, there was a good question um, asked us panelists, just wanna broaden it out there. You know, can you, can you basically pipe all these logs somewhere to object storage? And the answer is yes, you can configure all of this information to route you know, wherever you'd like in, your, in whichever installation you are into object storage. The, the easy yeah. way that you can probably do is uh, at least get it to Databricks file system by turning on this little option here. Um, I usually end up doing something else as well because I don't always wanna go read it from there, but that's, that's at least a good start. Easy, easy start there. All right, did it show my log4j metric? No, it's not, interesting. Okay, so the other thing I'll do a quick sort of shout out to that, that uh, is more of the cluster level is the Ganglia UI to take the Spark metrics that are that are being collected and and visualize them for us out of the box. So if you're used to looking at you know monitoring clusters, some of this probably makes a lot of sense. If you're new to it, it might be a little bit much at first, but uh, we can kind of see cluster memory. We can see network activity for a streaming job. I kind of just want to make sure, hey, there is network activity. Once that net network activity stops, I'm not really doing anything, and and I probably need to go check some other places. Hey, good. We got an orange. <laughs> we got an orange node, which is nice. That shows us that it's going to kind of give us some cues that this node is getting overworked compared to others. So maybe more nodes, maybe a bigger node size. Uh, usually I'd kind of drill in and figure out, is this a driver or a worker, uh, which will tell me a little bit about what to do. And then this is the riskiest part is I'm going to try and search for a streaming metric in here. So down here, these driver streaming metrics, this is because I enabled streaming metrics in that, in that first uh, cluster config I showed you. And so I can get to processing rate and latency uh, here as well. Um, I don't really go here. I use the other view I showed you. I'll do more like what Hector's gonna show us in a moment. And finally, the thing I skipped because I don't really do my production jobs in notebooks, nothing wrong if you do, but that's usually we're packaging them up as jars or wheel files, but if you're running in a notebook, you have this right here, which is amazing. So it takes that same input versus processing rate, puts it right on the same chart for me, which is really kind of what I want to see. And 
Um, batch duration is giving me the average right there. So I don't even have to hover over anything. And then it's giving me this, this query progress event that we're going to talk about more. It's giving me the latest one right here. You'll watch this batch ID. It'll change, uh, within five seconds or so it'll change. And what I can do is I can grab that whole thing, take it out and go make sense of it. Uh, it's got some goodies in here, like, uh, like the metrics showing the, the lag from latest offset. I can kind of see how many records per offset. If I look closely at input rows, uh, number of input rows will show me the actual count. All the stuff we use to build these other charts is here. So what are the challenges we're facing? The challenges are, you know, I may not be running from a notebook or I'm not going to be staring at my notebook all day. Uh, my cluster might terminate and uh, then I'm going to lose this log visibility, at least after a certain point of time. We might physically delete the cluster too to clean up our workspace, depending on our policies. I have, I have clients where we're, we as developers who build the code can't go into the workspace in production. They just want it completely locked down. And so we ship the logs and the metrics to log analytics. And then we have access there that's very much removed from the code itself and the data itself, most importantly. And so we start to build more custom solutions, not just because we want a, large, a longer time window than this offers, but also because we want to um, maybe aggregate across different, different jobs and different clusters too, or at least, at least search across different clusters. So with that, uh, I think I'll hand it over to Hector and I'm happy to come back and answer any questions on this side too, if there's time. Awesome, let me go ahead and share my screen now. It's just some questions while uh, Hector's pulling that up. You mentioned that uh, you can get data processing within six to 10 seconds. In your, in your practice as a consultant, uh, using implementing these streaming techniques, usually that works for, for most customers when they ask for near real time. Uh, just kind of curious for our audience, uh, is that like a generally accepted practice? And then how, how do you kind of work with customers to understand the cost impl implications of like the latency of what they want to execute? Yeah. So usually I have a, a clue of what's, what's acceptable based on if I'm talking to like an application architect of the actual like platform, the customer is using, they want a much tighter window than like the BI team or the product analytics team. That's like, if you can get it to us in a minute or two minutes. Um, so usually what I do is I start with, what are we going to do with this data? And I know that's not really a system level approach, but it usually is a good starting point. Are we going to alert because something's wrong and how much time till someone reacts to that alert, uh, that kind of thing. If we're doing recommendations, you know, I'm usually in the place where it's, it's a little bit more like, yeah, 10, 10 seconds, even a minute's acceptable for getting new data into our recommendations process. Um, I think if you're working with, you know, uh, an e-commerce where you're going to do those recommendations, like on the window, then, then it starts to change. And yeah, the conversation is really. Uh, for me, it's usually let's explore when we when we change parallelization, when we change our code a little bit, how tight we can get this window, how low we can get the latency, and then we'll give you a cost estimate of what that's going to cost versus waiting the 10 seconds. Uh, you guys might have more to add to that, though, so feel free. It's great hearing a, a, like a, an actual like practitioner's perspective on it, and I completely agree. For me, it, it always comes down to, well, what does your business want? How much are they willing to pay? because essentially with the cloud, it's all metered. So you want faster, like, do you understand the, like the implications of that? That was just something I wanted to touch on since you kind of, uh, you kind of teased out that really, really awesome, fast, like rate, right? Six seconds to getting your data latency, like insight latency is really fast. But I just wanna make sure everybody understands that there's a price tag that comes with getting really, really low latency on your data insight. So, um, you know, Dustin is a, a professional and he's out there kind of educating like, like what all this stuff means. So uh, while you can get really fast data, I just want to make sure everybody understands that, you know, everything has a cost in the cloud. With that, Hector, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Franco. Um, yeah, so Dustin did a good job of kind of bringing light to like, a, you know, real life scenarios and, and what we go through. Um, I did want to... Uh, give my experience as well, some of the challenges and, and really the motivation behind, you know, spending time building a solution for, for this problem, right? So let's go ahead. Uh, let me know if my, 
fonts too small, but I'm going to go ahead and trigger a live stream while I talk. And then, and this is just a regular Kafka consumer. So structure streaming, reading from Kafka, um, reading some data. Let's go ahead and start this. And really, so the motivation here is as I became involved, you know, internally with, with our streaming um, SME group, uh, and I jump in with customers to deal with performance issues or, or missing data. Uh, if everyone knows me on this call, the first thing I really want to do is jump in with the customer, ask them about the source, ask them about the sync. And really, if, if all possible, I really, the first thing I really want to do is take a look at that query progress that Dustin showed. Okay. So this query progress is from the streaming query listener class. Um, and it, it really shows you a bunch of good information at the micro batch level, right? So a streaming application, all it is, is, is micro batches over a period of time. Um, so every single time I jump with the customer to debug any of those issues, I really wanna take a look at this glimpse of window first. Um, and as you can see here, as I'm speaking, this is constantly being updated. And this is a small data set. Um, imagine now when we're dealing with 100K records per second, um, and you're trying to monitor this, right? It, it's very challenging and refreshes very quickly. Um, so it's kind of hard to capture, right, as we're debugging live. Um, but again, some of the things that I like to highlight that I look at um, is batch ID, that it's incrementally going up so I can identify, I can identify the micro batch. Um, the input rate, that gives me an idea of, you know, how you're partitioning, how you're splitting your data with these micro batches, like the sizes that you're, you're the volume of data that you're processing. Uh, and then the pro the input versus processing rate, right? Again, like Dustin said, you know, gives you a good idea if you're catching up with the input, if your process is catching up with the input. Um, and now even more useful, uh, some of the other highlights is the source and sync location, specifically around Kafka. Uh, I love going into this source, um, source object and taking a look at, hey, it's Kafka. And hey, look, I'm looking at the offsets as they increment, as we incrementally pull them out of Kafka, right? It's extremely useful to see that, especially if you're may maybe missing data or something that can process, you can see if it, you know, if we actually pulled the message and it got lost in the processing, or if we never pulled it from, from that topic, right? Very useful there. And I have one partition here, but if you have like 10 partitions, it actually maps it out to the particular partition as well, which is very cool. Uh, one of the other callouts here, uh, as I have this open, is we newly in Databricks uh, implemented this metric that you can see how far behind of offsets um, you are. Um, so going to Franco's, you know, point is, you know, you we can scale this out, you know, on uh, unlimited nodes, right? We're on the cloud now, um, but you have to measure performance versus cost. Um, so here we can see we're lagging behind some some offsets. Um, do we want to increase the cluster and spend more, or are we okay, you know, falling behind by 531 offsets? Right. So, do you have I, um, Hector? Do you have like a recommendation on like is this way too much? You know, what what did what? How would you kind of judge um, what what a recommended offset would be okay with? Behind offsets behind is that what you mean? Yeah. So sorry. Just with any of these metrics, like when you see this, you know, how do you know that this is too much, or is there a, an acceptable level of offsets behind? How would you how would you kind of gauge that? That's really a business question there, right? So it's like how much how much data am I getting? What velocity? And then at what rate from SLA from the topic to your you know consuming table? Do you want to wait, right? So for example. If it's high velocity, you know, at millions of records can mean a lot for your business, right? Like those million records, having those available within 15 minutes of that live table, it's very important, right? Um, or maybe you're a million behind, but, you know, the, the business team only looks at the table every once a day. Then maybe we can, we're okay just chugging along those million records that, you know, maybe it was a peak time and now it's catching up through the entire day. And we're okay with that because the business team queries it every once every day, right? So, it really depends on, you know, how, uh, you know, what the SLA times are, you know, for this data, right? And, and a couple more variables, but does that? Yeah, that makes sense. The question that came in from LinkedIn, is it based on partition? Uh, what based off partition? Yeah, I, I think that they might be thinking of like micro batches aligning it to partition. I don't really think that that is the case. I think uh, when we're talking about batch, I think it depends on files, which could be partition, 
But I think from a bus, when you're reading from a bus, I don't think like event hub or something like that. I don't, I don't think it, it matters on the partition. Is that right? And um, if I interpret maybe the question, maybe topic partitions they meant, like these are total offsets behind for the total uh, offsets for all the partitions, right? Got it. That are available, the total. Um, if you're talking about topic partition. Can you uh, define, so yeah. can you define the offset? Yes, yes, in the stream. Yeah, so we have this thing called earliest or latest. Um, so earliest would be from zero offset, latest would be from the latest offset. Or you can specify per, per topic partition what offset you want to pick up. And that would be in the configuration. That's definitely an option as well. Um, Follow up so to the partition question. Let's say if I have four partitions in Kafka, it would be per partition? What would be, which number are we talking about? Uh, when reading uh, the, from the earlier question, is it based on partition? So let's say they have four partitions in Kafka. So the micro batches would be per partition. Each micro batch reads from those four partitions. Got it. Right? Thank you. So now if we take a look at this monitoring, this is a good question. So maybe I'll elaborate more here. If we take a look at this uh, metrics, when it prompts it, when it shows it to you in the console, um, and we look at the source specifically, right now I only have one partition, maybe I should have got a, an example with four partitions, but any metric is per parti topic partition, except for the metrics falling behind. That's a total across all partitions. But the offsets, when, when it's keeping track of what offsets you're picking up, it's per topic partition uh, information. So good, good question there. Um, so as I debug, where was it? So I, as I debug this, right, th that's the information I take a look at, right? It, it's very useful and 60 to 70% of the time, this gets me to, you know, uh, the root problem, right? Um, whether it's latencies, whether it's missing data, it, it really guides me where, where I should go. The only problem with this, again, it's refreshing. Um, and some of the alternatives like Dustin pointed out is if we look at the driver logs, so the micro batch execution uh, log, uh, which I call the query progress, it's, it's also available in the driver in the driver logs in the log uh, log for j output. So if I scroll down here, you'll see that I can see the the micro batch execution and all that information that you saw in that rolling window. Now this is going to be a nice static view, um, but I, I think of, think of this at scale. You still have to continue to scroll down to the next micro batch and the next micro batch to be you know to compare how it's progressing along. Um, I managed to do this with customers on on a call. Uh, sometimes it's not a problem, but you can see how this becomes kind of tedious and it becomes a very verbose problem. Um, and then if you think about the historic log, um, so let's say we, we can't run this live, uh, the customer didn't, you know, has turned it off and we have to, we, we can't just run it live on the call, then you can go ahead and download this log um, uh, file. And if I open this up, hopefully you can see it. What I would do next is, you know, parse through um, the micro batch execution stream, right? And by parsing through this, I can go ahead and look at through all their logs, through all history, and look at each micro batch and, and kind of debug it that way, see how it's been progressing over time as well. Uh, but you can see how this, again, this is all tedious work and some, some customers don't have this, haven't captured it in, in you know, in, in some sort of storage and, and they're all gone, right? So really, Till now, we, we can get away with all this, you know, all this debugging and it, you know, it's possible, but it's very painful. Um, and this just gets amplified when a customer comes in and says, hey, there's, there's been, a, there, was, there was an issue last week or her wish, an issue yesterday and the logs are long gone by now. And what we have to do is spend like an hour on the call trying to re, recreate that scenario. Okay. So that's all very painful. And this is really where the motor of, of you know, the solution came to be. Um, coming in this scenario and, un, you know, what can we do? We have all the information, you know, Spark does a good job of logging, but how do we harness that and to make it, you know, to make it insightful? Um, so let's look at the end goal here. Um, so what I, what, what I envision here is, okay, now that you have a bunch of streaming applications on, um, imagine a world where you can jump into a dashboard. I'm using Databricks SQL dashboard, but just you could use your own whatever whatever dashboard you use at your company. Um, you can log in every morning. You could go to the top top corner, have a scroll down button, 
with all your existing streaming pipelines, okay? So look at the ones that are relevant to your team, click on the, click on the pipeline, and be able to have a, a widgets and, and a dashboard that gives you a summary of how your streaming application is doing over time, right? Just logging in, having this insightful information in the morning would be, you know, would be pretty, would be pretty nice for, for each business team to have. So for example, let me take you through each widget a little bit. Um, let's look at this top left widget, right? Where it shows process rate and input rate. So if we wanna zoom in here. Um, as Dustin mentioned some of this, so I might reiterate it. Um, the green line represents the process, process processing rate. Uh, the red line represents the input rate. Um, ideally, as you take a look at this over a week, over, over a month, we really want that green line to be above that red line, right? We wanna be able to say, hey, our resources are processing this input rate, no problem. Um, if there ever is a case where the green line drops below the red line and you know, with a certain threshold that you put in place, then hey, alert me, send me an email, letting me know that my streaming is lagging behind at this point in time, right? So you can already see how that could be useful and, and seeing maybe there's a peak time there. Um, should I increase my, should I resize my cluster in the morning? Should I resize my cluster at night or maybe just on Saturdays, Fridays? This, this historic graph over time will give you a lot of insights there. And it's, you know, it's just simple as looking at the process rate versus the input rate. Um, and I, uh, at, at the micro batch level. Can I try to understand what's going on here for a second? Yeah. So your num input rows is the total amount of rows that's sitting to be processed. The input rows is how many new rows are, are showing up in each batch. And the process is how much it processed in that batch. So the blue line kind of tells you what is your overall kind of what's waiting out there. The green line is, the red line is how many new ones are coming in. And the green line is how much you're processing. Is that correct? Could I rephrase that? Yeah. The, the blue line is the number of total input rows per micro batch. So we're processing each micro batch. Uh, 100, 100K here is the total per that small micro batch. Yeah, right? and as you move as you move data points, you can capture how much per micro batch. Got so it. That's, and then that's a, that's a static input. The green and red are rates per second. per second. Yes. So this is how fast it's ingesting, and then how fast it is processing the data that it's ingesting. How much is map? How fast mapping out? How fast are cores and partitioning are being processed to be persistent, right? So I put, I, I like to put them three together. You could ideally separate the input rows out to a different uh, widget, um, but I just like to see the overall, you know, input of the rows and then look at my processing rate for the green versus red. So uh, a very good question just came in that kind of aligns to this and it kind of leads to something else, but a very, it was very good. So thinking about this, it's like, well, Databricks is auto-scaling. Can I just auto-scale my stream to just handle it? Because the, the reason why you're doing this is because of that, of that problem, I believe. So like you have, to, you have to understand what's going on with the cluster and how much it's processing in order to do it. Can you kind of articulate why you have to do this, why you can't use auto-scaling, and then if you know about the future of it? Yeah, so good question. Auto scaling is, by the way, if, if you're in streaming, it, it's a challenging problem in streaming, okay? Sp particularly when structured streaming in Spark because the streaming applications are greedy, okay? When you think about auto scaling, uh, how do you auto scale? You see that there's task waiting, right? Um, so that's how it auto scales. In a streaming application, it's unbounded. So there's always gonna be task waiting so your stream just keeps going up and up and up, and then who's going to dictate when it stops, right? It's a, it's a challenging problem. Um, so in that case, you know, for best practices, even in production jobs, uh, if you're thinking about it, you know, auto scaling is not going to be the best option for you in production jobs. It's just, it, it's just not, you know, it's it's not mature enough. There's work being done, but it's it's a hard problem to solve. And for that reason, you need to monitor, you know, how you know the processing rate versus input rate of, uh, you know, how you're doing the, the life check, you know, the health check of your streaming application. And then a whole different conversation here. We'll have another data cloud episode for this um, cost versus performance, right? So if you have auto scaling, it'll scale to X amount of, you know, 
nodes, which have cost you a lot of money, do you want that? Or are you willing to just take the, you know, take the SLA for it and save money there, right? So auto scaling, there's no solution in Databricks. It's only for batch, it's not for streaming. Um, we have, you know, accelerators internally that we could, you know, look at these metrics and based on these metrics, you can have an API call to the cluster to resize it. Uh, that's actually our best answer today with bigger customers. Um, and we have, you know, again, a plug in here, Delta Live Tables, which also solves for auto scaling. Um, so if you haven't heard of Delta Live Tables, look it up. Uh, it's, it got released in Spark Summit. That's going to be a, a, you know, behind the scenes, it could be streaming and it could have auto scaling implemented internally. So some of these issues might go away, but still, you, you really want to get un, an understanding of how much data you're processing with the resources that you have. Um, it's always going to be a thing that you want to, you know, look at, even if there's auto scaling. Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to kind of tie tie back together that that Hector touched on. If you want simple streams, check out the Delta Live Tables. That will be where all of the new, latest and greatest tech is going to go for managing streams simply across Databricks. Uh, if you do want to do streaming, the what I, it's starting to become the old-fashioned way to me, but where you just write the code manually versus using one of the newer tools. But if you want to do it manually, don't use auto scaling on streaming clusters. Like Hector said, it's going to scale all the way up and it's going to stay there. So it's not going to auto scale. It's just going to consume the maximum amount of resources. Another thing that Hector said that not a lot of people know that you can do on Databricks is that you can, while a stream is running, you can send an API command to the cluster to just inject more nodes so that it will, you can manually scale. What I, what I, you know, I like to call it smart scaling because you're not just auto scaling uh, just kind of naively, you're smart scaling. You're, you're taking a look at your metrics and then you're telling the cluster specifically add four more nodes because you know that you need to add that. And there are accelerators around this if you want to do it manually. And it won't but, kill your stream. And it won't, thank you very much. That's exactly what I was trying to articulate here. You can inject nodes into the cluster with the API and it will not kill the stream. It'll just, those, no, those nodes will become available for tasks to be scheduled on. So it's kind of like this great thing. Not a lot of people know that you can do this, that you can just call up the cluster API and inject more nodes. You can even do this on batch jobs or like anything. You can just inject more nodes into a process. And it's, it has to be with streaming, it works because you're, it's constantly rescheduling what's going on. Like it's constantly reading and re reprocessing everything. With batch jobs, it, the scheduler is not gonna run again midstream, but because with streaming, it's constantly checking in. So I just wanna, I wanna kind of articulate those, those functionality out because it's very important to like how this all fits together. And there was, there was a follow-up question that was, you know, can you automate that process? And sure, since it's, you know, via the cluster's API, you could automate that in whatever fashion you'd like. Perfect. And I just um, wanted to also okay. drill in, I think you kind of glazed over it, but I mean, it was asked earlier. So just alerting, right? Yeah, of course, this is a great dashboard and I'd love to see it on like the big screen when I walk into the office kind of thing, but you could also set up alerts to send this to email, correct? Yes, yes. And I say yes from Databricks SQL dashboard, uh, Databricks SQL capabilities, right? Uh, again, if you use your own dashboard, it would depend, but for uh, Databricks SQL, we do have alerting capabilities that we can create uh, based on a you know query class or a threshold that it, you know that's met. And it would be an email, or it could be like Slack, for example, or some sort of plugin. Cool. Um, so I'll I'll scroll through the rest and then get to the solution. Um, so let's uh, let's spend the next five minutes doing that. But again, a lot of good useful information, especially the source and sync. Um, as, as you know, you read from Kafka, the different offsets, or you read from Delta tables and they have different versioning and then sync location. It's just very good, useful information to have over time. And then maybe get a glimpse of your latest batch, right? So uh, again, maybe an alert scenario where if your latest batch is processing zero messages, send me an email. It's not gonna be a red flag, but it's gonna say, hey, you know, during this time, the cluster's reading zero uh, records. Let's go check it out. Maybe we, you know, maybe a live stream is not a good answer for us. Maybe we'll use trigger once. So again, this, this insightful information um, can make you proactive, right? Can make you have an idea of your stream over a month, um, be proactive of how you allocate your resources and therefore save money as well, right? Um, so uh, I hope um, this, this, this insightful 
I created these widgets. So it's kind of my query on top of the metrics that I'm going to collect that I'll show you. Um, but you can imagine there's, you can create more widgets and go crazy and, and you know, have more use case driven uh, monitoring uh, widgets, right? So this is just a simple example. Hector, um, you, you actually mentioned a pretty powerful uh, uh, idea that was actually also a question uh, around trigger once. Would you mind just like mentioning what that is real quick? Yeah, so trigger once is, uh, it's capability in structure streaming where instead of having your stream always on, you can have a trigger once, um, trigger will trigger once and read all the offsets that are available at that point in time, persist them, and once it's complete, you know, once the processing is complete, turn off until the next, you know, uh, job trigger, right? And you can imagine you have a job orchestrator that will trigger this streaming application every half hour. Uh, what that does is you no longer have it always on. So you're not being, you know, you're not being charged for 24, 24 seven cluster. Uh, instead, your streaming application will just read the messages, you know, process them in 10 minutes and turn off. And then till the next trigger of the next, you know, hour period, you turn it on again for 10 minutes, turn it off and so on, right? You can imagine how much cost savings that could be on the cloud. Um, and we really, where that comes in is when we talk about customers and SLAs. Um, some people say, you know, I want near real time data, you know, always on, which it, it sounds good. But if the velocity of your data is, is low, like it, you know, it comes in every hour or so, why have a stream always on, right? Maybe just have a trigger once function and trigger it every top of the hour. Um, that's one scenario. The other scenario is if your consumers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, log in every morning only or check it once a day, you know, why have a streaming application that's always on processing, keeping your cluster on, you know, accumulating cost, where you could just do a trigger once function, maybe twice a day, and that would be good enough for, you know, the queries that are taking place for that, uh, that table that's being consumed, right? So it gives you a lever uh, so you don't have to have your streaming always on. And it continues to have the same features as a streaming application where it keeps the offset, uh, it keeps a checkpoint, and it keeps up with, you know, where it left off from, from the last uh, processing uh, batch. Great, thanks. Um, Okay, so then the solution here, um, I'll spend the next five minutes or so, so I don't take up all the time. Uh, let me go to my notebook. Um, and actually I'm gonna show Lucid chart um, just so, so everybody can see a bigger picture here. Um, so this is the landscape, this is the, the architecture flow of, of what I built. So what I showed you is actually the top right corner. So that's where the dashboard analytics comes in place with SQL analytics. Um, so that's in the top layer, but if we shift over to the left side first, where it says collect metrics. So this is your environment. So think of, you have production jobs, let's call them job one, job two, job three. They're going to run like normal. They have their own logic. Um, what, what occurs here is for each job, you attach the streaming query listener, the, the custom stream query listener. Um, and that streaming query listener runs in the background as a thread. Um, and it's collecting those query progresses and is redirecting those messages, those metrics over to Kafka. Okay. So it runs in the background. You, you attach it once and it just runs in the background as you actually, and it lives alongside the application, right? It's not going to die off or in, until your job's turned off, uh, then that turns off. And we're redirecting everything to, to a message bus. And there's a reason for this. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One reason is because if you think about the metrics, they're small size. Um, and if you think about the velocity, like you know, how, how fast we're capturing these metrics, it, it's pretty high velocity, right? So because of these, these uh, because of this, uh, the way that it does it, Kafka will be the best, um, the best way to store them, right? If, uh, if you put them in cloud storage, there's gonna be some small file problems you're gonna have to deal with, right? So. Um, as of today, and we're solving that, but as of today, uh, a message bus, message bus serves great for this use case. So across all your applications, we're collecting all the metrics into one topic. Think about your monitoring topic. Um, and if you're doing streaming, you ideally have Kafka already. So just create a topic for monitoring. Uh, so we, we dump all the, the metrics in Kafka, and then we use a structured streaming application where you can just collect all those metrics and dump them into cloud storage in Delta format for optimized query, right? So 
this is kind of like the workflow. You can see how I added trigger options. So I added this little widget there because uh, it's gonna, you're gonna decide how, how quickly you want these metrics delivered, right? Uh, you know, do you want, uh, again, going back to what John asked and, and the trigger once, maybe I care to collect these metrics at the end of the day. And right, so this job will run once at the end of the day and I'll trigger it tomorrow again using structure streaming trigger once. Um, or maybe you want these insights at, you know, as fast as possible. Um, so then that stream is always on, but you dictate that, that's, that's optional. So Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. So let's say, uh, I'm thinking about this from a practitioner's lens, right? So, uh, and I'm combining the tooling that you're using here. So let's just say we're gonna be using Databricks SQL as a monitoring tool because I like the dashboard and I want the alert. And what, what I understand is like, let's say as a practitioner, I wanna put up the dashboard, I wanna integrate these components into my, you know, as Lee pointed out, like my wall screen that monitors all of our stuff, like our, our monitoring system. But let's say that I only care to have it once an hour. So I can trigger, I can set that trigger as a schedule, uh, trigger once, right? And schedule it to run once an hour in, let's just say in our new uh, the Databricks uh, workflow tool, uh, the, the, the new jobs mechanism, right? And let's say that in, in Databricks SQL, I can set a refresh schedule in my dashboard for once an hour. And I align those two orchestrations together where the, the out once an hour job and then the, this Databricks SQL schedule will kind of align to each other. So every hour I get all of my data refreshed from all of my streams and then I can get my alerts. So then because I have all of my refreshes scheduled aligned with my data, basically once an hour I can check in on all my streams and once an hour I can be alerted if like, let's say I can put uh, a, a, an equation into the alert that says if I'm at 85% capacity, so with my processing and my input, if I if I'm close, if I'm like I don't I don't know from a practitioner's perspective, you tell me where where that bar is on getting close to like the top end. But like I start getting alerts if I'm at eighty five percent, and then I start getting bigger alerts if I'm at ninety percent. So as a practitioner, I can use these tools, these trigger options and these refresh options with inside Databricks to kind of create my own monitoring system and even automate a lot of it. Because I know. There were a lot of questions about automating. Um, so I just want to connect those dots, but this is, this, is, this is actually a pretty amazing architecture that you put together here. Yeah, you bring up a lot of good use cases. Like, the, you know, and this is what I'm talking to customers with, right? Like these, these ideas are all possible, but this is the starting framework, right? That's, that's what I want you to think about. These, these tools have existed, but this is the starting framework that opens up the possibility to answer all those questions. And if some of you are looking at this and maybe potentially looks daunting, um, that's a good segue because this is, it's very simple to create actually. And that's the motive of my, you know, the project that I've been working on is to create accelerators for you to be able to do this quickly, right? And really the most daunting task for, for, for customers is, is reading, the, reading the documentation, right? It's, it, the documentation scattered, you know, you might find some information. If there is an answer, it might be, you know, very vague. So you have to go ahead and, and you know, be savvy with it and, and build the solution yourself and spend hours kind of researching. So that's really the motive here is, even though this is daunting, it, it's very simple to create. And what I did, what I summarized summarize this by is three simple steps to, to, to create this, okay? So let me walk you through the simple steps and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, so if we take a look at the, back to my notebook, how do we build this? So first, um, and again, I'm trying to simplify this. So there might be some little things between, but these are really the main components. And um, even if you're not in Databricks, these are still applicable to, to, your, to your Spark structure streaming. So first you wanna create a custom streaming query listener. And I say custom because the regular, um, whoops, uh, because we always wanna extend from the streaming query listener that exists. And the custom comes from like, hey, I'm gonna deliver these messages, messages to Kafka. That's where the custom part comes in. So if we take a look at that custom um, script, this is all really it takes. Um, I won't go too deep into this, but what really is this is doing is it's using that query progress um, uh, definition, which again, it has the, 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 the metrics in, and we're using a Kafka producer to push out those messages to, to Kafka based on your configurations, right? 
Simple as that. Um, everyone can use this, you know, compile it in your jars or use it however you want in a notebook. Um, but this is as simple as it gets. It's, hey, give me that query progress in that JSON format and send it over to Kafka. Let's not worry about parsing right now. So this, this is all you need for the query, query listener. And then you attach it, uh, you have a following command where you attach it to the Spark uh, listeners, right? So once you create it, you attach it. So this is gonna be, think of this as a util notebook. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this uh, after data collab. Um, think of this as a util uh, notebook that you're gonna call from your application, right? So let's look at step two. So once we created the custom query listener, then we attach it to the cluster, which is actually the application that you're running, right? So if I scroll down, let's pretend like this is my job one, my streaming application that's live right now. All I really have to do is go to a cell, uh, do a percent sign run, and run, give that path to that uh, custom query listener that we created. So by running the cell, it'll create that, 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 uh, that class and they're added to the listener. And now it's gonna be attached to our job, right? And the reason we wanna kind of parameter, not parameterize this, but you know, access from each cell is because then you can just copy this command uh, for every application that you have in production, right? So it can be reutilized because the cluster configuration is all set up in this query listener uh, notebook. So once you run that, uh, you can go ahead and go list the Spark Streams list listeners. And you'll see that the Kafka listener has been appended to the list of listeners that we have existing in, in Databricks. Right? So you can confirm that this has been attached and is running in the background. And then you continue on with the, you know, the regular job flow. So we created a custom quiz, uh, query listener. We attached it to our streaming job. The last thing you really need to do is create a consumer. So all these metrics are being collected in Kafka. Let's go ahead and create the consumer for that. And I created the consumer in a form of um, uh, structured streaming. So here, this will be your regular you know, streaming job for Spark. And the key thing that I did here, most of you are gonna be, if you're in the streaming world, you're gonna become familiar with you know, the, the read stream and write streams and the parsing. But what I really wanted to accelerate um, as I share this notebook with you, with, with everyone, is the schema, okay? So as you looked at the query progress, it's a JSON message. Within the JSON message, there's many objects and there's some nesting in there. Um, and you gotta understand what the schema is so you can parse those messages, those raw messages. Um, and again, that's what makes people shy away from this is I know there's input rate. I know there's processing rate, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to go research up what's going on there. You know, I, I'm going to, I don't have time for it. You push it off. Right. So I wanted to build this out of the box kind of schema that you can use for your consumer. Right. And this is, this is really what it is. You can see all these fields are familiar to what we've kind of just been talking about over this whole episode. Right. It's uh, um, the metrics that are collected by that query progress. So you put the raw message in Kafka. Now on this side of things, when, when we consume it, we'll apply the schema, which simplifies things a lot, you know, a lot, a lot better. Uh, and then we dump them into Delta, so or, or cloud storage in, in a layer that we can run analytics against it, right? Um, by dumping it into a table, then we have we have each each row represents that micro batch information per streaming application, um, and that's really what powers your uh, your dashboard, right? So those are kind of the three simple steps. Uh, I know when I went through it quickly, but uh, any question, any last questions there? And I'm gonna share this content with you, so I'm sorry I didn't get to detail, but I'll share it with uh, everyone after data club episode. No, that just that. Um... You're, you're correct that it actually isn't that daunting. At first I was daunted, but you know, that was um, with, with just 10 minutes to show us that, that was incredible. So I'm excited to try this out on my own. I think we've butted up mostly to the end of our session. And I know, you know, this will be recorded or shared on YouTube. And like Hector said, um, all the stuff will be out there. Um, we can share this as well. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out if you have additional questions for us. Yeah, we'll get it posted up to the the Tech Talks the Tech Talks GitHub repo where we normally store all the notebooks that come from Data Cloud Lab, um, and then we'll we'll share it out on the on social uh, after we get them all loaded up there. Um, Karen, do you want to take us out with any last words? Sure.
Well, thank you so much, Dustin and Hector. That was an awesome presentation. And um, just echoing what Franco's saying, we'll, we'll get the materials up and I'll also post them in the, the YouTube link too. So they'll be in that description. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thank you.